talks about just homogeneous linear systems. And the forms of the solutions for what we'll get when we solve them. Right. So, uh, what's going to look very familiar is especially the very first one, we talk about distinct values and distinct solutions that we have. But if we noticed um, from last time, on the previous section, I know we saw that a lot of the solutions had the form of x equal to some numbers, call them like k1 and k2, and we'll stick to a two by two for now. Something like x equal to, and then k1, k2, we stick to a two, <coughs> a two by one vector, and then times e to some number times t. We'll call that call that number lambda i in this case. And then times t. Now as for a system of two equations, obviously it's a three by one if it's three equations, or a four by one if it's four, and so on. All right? Um, that implies that we should be able to find a solution of the form of the form x equal to just k1 through kn times e to the lambda t. Right. Or uh, also abbreviated just x equals, and then we'll, we'll write that vector with all the k's as just a capital K. on ourselves when we're writing stuff <coughs> when we're trying to figure out what everything's equal to. Right. For a homogeneous system of x prime equal to ax. All we need to really figure out is what that vector k is going to be and then what that value for lambda is going to be and actually that second one is going to dictate what the first one is in this case. Right? So <coughs> um, if we're going to find the non-trivial solution, the one that's not just the zero vector for everything, Right, we need to find the eigenvalues of A. So close. There it is. We're going to find the eigenvalues of that, that corresponding matrix A that we get from you know, our systems of equations. <coughs> and we do that by solving for the determinant of A minus lambda I, which hopefully looks familiar for eigenvalues and then eigenvectors from linear algebra. If not, we'll talk about it briefly.
finding the determinant of a minus lambda i and setting it equal to zero gives us the eigen or the eigenvalues, and then we get the corresponding eigenvectors. will give us a solution. It will give us that k, really, or the, the vector k that we're talking about in this case for the multiple vectors of k uh, when we have multiple solutions there. It gives us the solution x equal k e to the lambda t. That's just the basic gist of what we're looking at. Um, kind of a background to at least what we, we saw before and then what will apply to this one. <coughs> if we notice the form of that solution with the e to the lambda t part should look very familiar because it looks very similar to the solution, the form of the solution that we had or homogeneous equations when it was just a single equation in diff EQ1, right? And then we're gonna have the same types of cases based off of that. If I had two solutions and I had, you know, one of them was lambda, lambda is one and lambda is equal to two or m equals one and m equals two in that case, uh, or r equals one and r equals two, depending on what your teacher said, then we had <coughs> just two solutions. I would do C1 e to the one t plus C2 e to the two t. Same idea here. So we're going to start with the first of our three cases. And it's going to be the same first case that we would discuss when we, you know, back in, again, did Q1. We're going to have distinct real eigenvalues as the first case that we look at. If that matrix A has distinct real eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda n, then the general solution of that homogeneous system, the x prime equal to ax, is going to be given by just x equals c1 k1 e to the lambda 1 t plus c to k2, e to the lambda 2t, and so on up through lambda n. So it's the simplest case, just as it was before, you know, in the, in the other class. It's the simplest case because if they're distinct real eigenvalues, then they're always going to have a distinct eigenvector that corresponds to them. And we can find that eigenvector, multiply it <coughs> by that e to the lambda t part, and then just given a an arbitrary constant that goes along with it. So let's start with an example of that. Solve the system of equations dx dt equals 2x plus 3y. And dy dt equals 2x plus y. So our 
first step in diff Q1 would have been to find the M, find the characteristic equation and the roots. First step here is gonna be to find those eigenvalues correspond to whatever we have here. If I wanted to write this in terms of the vector and the matrix that we're looking at, I'm gonna have X is equal to two, three, two, one, or sorry, x prime is equal to two, three, two, one times x. All right, and that gives me my, my matrix A. That was the first problem on the homework, just rewriting, rewriting it with that matrix. They got, that gives me my matrix A. That's going to allow me to take the determinant of A minus lambda I, set it equal to zero, get my eigenvalues for that. All right. Determinant of a minus lambda i in this case, 2 minus lambda, only 1 minus lambda, so 3, 2, evaluate that one. I'm just going to evaluate that, a times d minus b times c. So that's going to give me 2 minus lambda times 1 minus lambda, and then minus two times three. I end up with two minus three lambda plus lambda squared and then minus six. just lambda squared minus 3 lambda minus 4. Set that equal to 0, solve for lambda. All right, it's just a quadratic equation. I can factor it. <coughs> it's going to factor into lambda minus 4 and lambda plus 1. get 4 and negative 1 as my eigenvalues for that particular A. And the next step is just going to be to find those corresponding eigenvectors, the K1 and K2 in this case, since there's only two of them, that go along with each of those. So I'm just going to plug those values in to a minus lambda i, the, the actual matrix, a minus lambda i. And then reduce row echelon form, solve for any free variables, which hopefully we have, because that's the only way we can actually solve these and get a vector like this. So if I have, let's say for, let's start with lambda equal to negative one, because that's what I started with. A minus lambda i in this case is going to be 2 minus negative 1 and then 3. And this one will stay 2 and then we have 1 minus negative 1. So this is just the matrix 3, 3, 2, Just plugging in again, plugging in the specific eigenvalue into a minus lambda i there. Try to do that, yeah. Uh, remind, remind me why we only plug in a minus down the top left and the bottom right. Uh, because i is the identity matrix, and that means it's just ones on the diagonal. Uh, okay, okay. So one, zero, zero, one there. So okay. that's why we do it. Right. Reduce row echelon form, R2 minus 2 thirds R1. Just 
going to give me 3300. Zero, zero. Oh, I should be, sorry. Let's step here and start doing this. I wanted to do that up here, but I'm just going to start it at this step. To find these eigenvectors, I want to make sure to augment this with just the zero vector. All right, so. 0, 0 in this case. And that stays 0, 0 if I do any operation to it. And if I do 1 third R1. echelon form would be like basically the only time I actually do this all the way out. From here on out, we'll just kind of start here with the A minus lambda I, and then I'll say this is what the reduced row echelon form looks like, um, because it gets tedious to kind of go through those operations. But hopefully, seeing those types of operations know what we're talking about. If not, <coughs> um, matrices are probably going to look kind of weird at this point. So if we need some, some linear algebra review now is the time. All right, but if I'm going to solve that then, because of the way that this is set up, I have a free variable since, you know, I'm not guaranteed this just says zero times k1 plus zero times k2 is zero. That's not going to tell me anything. And it tells me one times k1 plus one times k2 is zero. I can choose basically anything for either K1 or K2 in this case, and then the other one will be dependent on that one. So typically I always use the second one or the third one as the free variable. You don't have to, in this case, it technically doesn't matter, but I'm just gonna say, we let K2 be equal to, I think in the book they use S. I don't necessarily like S's because they can look like fives and things like that, but I'll, I'll stick with that. So if I let K2 be equal to S, that means 1K1 plus 1S is equal to 0. So K1 must be equal to negative S. Right. And that means my vector K1, the corresponding eigenvector that goes along with my first eigenvalue here, is going to be negative s and s. Right? I don't want to necessarily use those. s is a free variable. I can, it can be anything. And I can base it on whatever I want. As long as the ratio between these two stays the same, it doesn't matter what s is. And any vector that we use <coughs> will be just fine. It'll be linearly independent of anything else that's not just you know the same ratio. So anytime we see something like this, I'm always just going to say at this point, let S be whatever makes things easier on us. In this case, the only thing I could not choose for S here would be zero. Can't have this come out to the trivial zero vector. But if I let S equals, say, one, yeah, I did one here. Then I just get the vector negative one, one. And that's fine. That's the one that I'll use as K1. I could have let S be equal to 2. And I have negative 2 and 2. I could have let it be negative 1 if I wanted that first one to be 1, the second one to be negative. All right? Um, and that's important to note because a lot of times, since web work's going to be tough to work with trying to make sure we do all this, uh, it'll probably give you one of these to start with so that you, you do the right vector that it's expecting. So it might give you, as its, its answer, it'll give you a negative one down here and have you fill in this blank. Well, that means that S had to be negative one, so plug it into the other part to get that. All right, it'll be a little confusing there. I don't tend to go that far, like especially on tests or things like that, but for web work, it's a little weird just because of the nature of how you have to put answers in. All right, but that gives us our first vector, our first eigenvector that corresponds to the first eigenvalue. And then we're just going to do the same thing for the second one. So for lambda 2 was equal to 4. 
I'm going to have 3 minus, or sorry, 2 minus 4 is negative 2. And then 3 stays the same, 2 stays the same, and then 1 minus 4 is negative 3. And then I'm going to augment that again with the 0 vector here. Obviously, if I just add r2 to r1, or r1 to r2, I'll get zeros in that second row. And again, this is what should happen because I should end up with a free variable. If I didn't, then I wouldn't have any way of finding this vector. If, if I still had, like, say, a, a 1 right here, that would tell me what is, tr what is the case. That uh, K2 would be equal to zero. Yeah, that would say that K2 is equal to zero. And if K2 was equal to zero and I plugged it in here, that would also mean that K1 is equal to zero. So if I don't want to end up with that trivial, uh, you know, the trivial solution vector, then I should end up with some type of free variable that goes along with this. Otherwise, um, you know, we're already given our answers. It doesn't really help us. So if you don't end up with that, go back and make sure you got the right eigenvalue or you plugged in right and did those, those types of things correctly because we should end up with at least one there. All right. Let's K2 be equal to S again. This one's a little different. Negative 2K1 plus 3S is equal to 0. So subtract 3S, divide by negative 2, I get k1 is equal to just 3 halves s. And again, I can plug this in and I'll, I'll tell you for sure on web work, whatever happens, there, if we can avoid it at all, We'll avoid fractions and stuff like that inside of these vectors. So this vector k2, that looks like 3 halves s and s. I'll just let s be equal to 2. That'll give me just 3, 2. I have integers there and I don't have to, <clears throat> don't have to worry about fractions. Now, we'll see an answer later on where we end up with a fraction there, but that's because we're forced into it by something else, not for distinct eigenvalues. That's always be the case there. All right. Again, you could let s. I mean, you don't have. You could let s be equal to one here. Also, it doesn't have to be that, or four or something, or negative two. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as the you know plug it in in both places. Right. And that means our solution x is equal to c one. Uh, take the first eigenvector, so negative one one times e to the first eigenvalue is negative 1 times t. And then plus c2, take my second eigenvector, 3, 2, e2, second eigenvalue is 4, so e to the 4t. Right. Process for this makes sense. Understand where these are coming from. I'm going to go ahead and do one more with distinct eigenvalues. Just because, again, that's kind of the simpler one to deal with at the beginning. And we can at least start thinking about, uh, you know, finding the eigenvectors based on the reducer echelon form and things like that. But so far, so good. Pretty simple. Again, very similar idea to the solutions of just a single differential equation with distinct real roots in that case. Let's say I want to solve the system of equations. I'm just going to write this out as x prime equal to I have negative 4 
1 and 1, 1, 5 and negative 1, and 0, 1, negative 3 times x. And first things first, find those eigenvalues by taking the determinant, a minus lambda i in this case, negative 4 minus lambda, 5 minus lambda, and negative 3 minus lambda on the diagonal. Since I don't have a lot of zeros, you know, this is going to be, I've multiplied this out. And then plus this should be zero plus one, and then minus you know each of the other ones to use the thing. But from here on out, like I said, I told y'all last time I was going to cut out a lot of that. You can find the eigenvalues just by you know plugging into a calculator. That's fine if you find them that way. In fact, I think uh, even on web work, many of the problems will give you the eigenvalues that it's talking about for the most part too. So this ends up coming out to a simplified form, I believe, negative lambda plus 3, lambda plus 4, and lambda plus 5, lambda minus 5, sorry. Set that equal to 0, and the eigenvalues that you get out of this will just be negative 3, negative 4, and 5. So on, on the tests, that would be given. I'll, I'll give you, I'd still give you this part of the problem. I'll definitely give you this. And then I'll say it has eigenvalues of this. And then I will actually say it has associated reduced row echelon form. So basically the next step that we're going through right here, I will also give you. The only thing I'll have you really solve for from this will be to find those eigenvectors given the reduced row echelon form part of this. So, for the eigenvalue negative three, right? Basically the next step that I write, we plug that in obviously, so negative four minus negative three, I'll have a negative one there, I'll have an eight there, I'll have a, well, zero there. Uh, but even then, I'm, I don't care. The next step is basically, without even plugging into that, I'm just going to plug those in. On a calculator, you will have to put those in and then say reduce row echelon form of that. Make sure you get that right. So maybe I'll do that for this very first one, just so we remember. Put this. One and one, one eight, negative one, zero, one, zero. Put that into the calculator and then say reduce row echelon form of that. And it gives you, or row echelon form, whichever one you're more comfortable with. One, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, and then zero, zero, zero. And we're going to augment that with the zero vector. All right. I'm not worried about you doing all the steps in between. I, again, I say I encourage you not to at this point because it'll just take a while. From there, what can I say? I'm going to find this again. This will be what? Well, I'll give you this. Reduce row echelon form, you can augment it yourself. Um, but what would I do from here to find the eigenvector, which is what you do on a test? So you would let K3 okay. equal S then? Let K3 equal S means K1 minus S is equal to zero. So 
K1 is also equal to S, and I also know that K2 is zero, that one's actually not going to depend on the other ones. That one will always be zero, no matter what I choose S to be. So I have an S, zero, S. I can pick S to be anything. I'm just going to say that anything except zero in this case can't end up with a zero vector there. say one. So we end up with the, the associated eigenvector one zero one. Okay. Same idea for lambda two, the negative four, and then lambda three, the, the, the eigenvalue of five. Plug that into that one, and then again, reduce row echelon form. That one's going to come out to 1, 0, negative 10, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 0, 0. Augmented with the 0 vector. My third one is my free variable. Let k3 be equal to s, means k1 minus 10s is 0. So k1 is just 10s. And then k2 plus s is 0. So k2 is a negative. my vector k2, my eigenvector that goes along with this, I'll have, make sure I, you know, get the right 1, 2, and 3 in the right order here. We let k3 be equal to s and then solve for k1, so 10s, negative s, and s. Right. And again, I can just let k be equal to 1 there, or sorry, s be equal to 1 there. So then it's just 10, negative 1 and 1. And for the third one, same idea. Plug in 5 into a minus lambda i. Reduce row echelon form. And I end up with 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 8, and 0, 0, 0. I mean, if you're, if you're very, very comfortable with this and you can solve for it, I've seen people that can just say, All right, I know what this is supposed to be already. Um, based on this, it'd be like 1, 8, 1 or something. Sometimes people are very comfortable with that. But man, if you don't get it right and I can't see any work, then we might have problems. So <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't suggest that unless you're, you really know and you're really sure that you got it right. K3 is S in this case. K1 minus S is 0. So K1 is S. K, or K2 minus 8S is 0. So K2 is 8S. That makes my third eigenvector S, 8S, and S. Or if S is 1. Three by three, and again, I wanted to go through this obviously because it's still a simpler case, and we can kind of show this. And it's a three by three instead. Um, <coughs> so how we use the the eigen 
or find the eigenvectors on that. But still a simple form when we put this into the solution. But I did want to say, like, a, uh, again, throw this out there, and you'll see this when I send you the review because it'll have this exactly right. I'll give you, I'll give you these. I'll give you these actually in order. I will say um, the original equation, the original system of equations that we have, has eigenvalues negative three with associated reduced row echelon form of this. It has a negative four associated with that one. The only thing you'll do is basically this stuff right here. This and that. You want to go through all the, the rest of that process. The, the more important part, I mean, finding these is good. The more important part is making sure we recognize the right form of this, which is going to get more complicated when we don't have these distinct real eigenvalues. But in this case, just C1. 1, 0, 1, e to the negative 3t, and then plus c2, uh, 10, negative 1, 1, e to the negative 4t, and then plus c3, 1, 8, 1, e to the 5t. Again, the most straightforward case and easiest one to start with as we go there, uh, as we go through these. <coughs> Questions on that? And again, what you're expected to do, and what you're expected not to really have to do. All right. Then, let's move on to the ones that get a little bit more interesting because, again, we're dealing with systems of equations. It becomes uh, the the process of finding the right form is a little bit more complicated when we have multiple equations that we have to account for, like linear independence and things like that. So the next case was when we had repeated eigenvalues. I'm going to say repeated real eigenvalues, although, I mean, I guess it kind of goes with repeated values of any kind. We're not going to do repeated complex eigenvalues. That's, that's too, much, too much. So difference right off the bat with a system of equations is that if um, an n by n matrix Uh, we call A, just like we'll have set up, has an eigenvalue of lambda 1 that has a multiplicity of M. Right, then there's actually a couple of different things that could happen here. Right? And the first actually is the easiest one, makes it much, much easier on us if it's possible. Right? The first is that it might be possible to find M distinct eigenvectors, M linear, sorry, linearly independent eigenvectors. just by plugging in in the same way that we've been doing it before. So just by doing what we did in the previous case. Right. 
if that's what happens, if I can find, let's say I have a two by two and I can find two linearly independent eigenvectors, then it's gonna have the same form as the distinct real eigenvalues actually did. So our solution in this case is just going to be x equals, and I don't have to do anything. Remember, you know, we multiplied by a factor of x or x squared or something like that in the basic cases before to make it linearly independent. Well, I don't have to do that if my vectors are already linearly independent in this case. So the solution is just going to look like x equals c1 k1 e to the lambda 1t and then plus c2 k2 e to the lambda 1t plus and so on forever, however many of those we have. So c m k m e to the lambda 1t. I have multiplicity m. And again, I don't have any other, I'm not multiplying by t or t squared or anything like that. I don't need to because k1 and k2 and km, those are already linearly independent. So they make my system of equations <coughs> um, linearly independent already. So that's the simplest case that makes it, that's the easiest one, hopefully we have that. Not all the time. So the other possible situation is obviously I can't find m linearly independent uh, eigenvectors that correspond to this one eigenvalue. All right. So if there's only one eigenvector that corresponds to that lambda one that we're talking about, to that eigenvalue. then we can find m linearly independent eigenvectors equals, uh, well actually let's say x1 equals, and we'll have a, an eigenvector k11 e to the lambda 1t, and then x2 will be k21, which is very misleading because that's actually the same as the k11 that we found here, but it's the way they write it. I'm writing this out and then I'm going to tell you it's not as complicated as this looks. But then times t e to the lambda 1t, and then plus k2 2 e to the lambda 1t. And then x, so on to xm. And this is going to look weird. The only thing you really have to remember about the difference between this one is that we're going to keep using the, the same eigenvectors that we found before, this one's going to be k m1, and it'll have t to the m minus 1, and then over m minus 1 factorial. So the big difference there is that it's not just multiplied by a factor of t, but it's multiplied by a factor of t, and then take that whatever power it is, put a factorial in the denominator. All right, and that's e to the lambda 1t. And then plus all the way down to, you know, the stuff that we'll have here. So this would be k m2 t to the m minus 2 over m minus 2 factorial e to the lambda 1t. And then all the way down to km m e to the lambda 1t. That looks... I mean, it's not great anyways when we see what we're talking about, uh, but it looks more complicated than it actually is when we put it into practice. The main thing about it is making sure that we can find 
those eigenvectors. And what we do to find those eigenvectors is we use the ones that we already have. Instead of augmenting with the zero vector, all right, um, instead of augmenting with the zero vector, what we're going to do is augment them with the previous vector that we find. All right, makes sense. Not yet, because you haven't seen it. It's not going to look. It's, it's crazy. So, again, and I say this because this is how they write it, and I've double checked every resource I can find. You know, they write it this way, but this is actually this vector, like K11 and K21 will look the same in our solution. They're the same ones. And it'll be the same as KM1 there. We're just multiplying those by a new factor of T to make them linearly independent. So let's do, what time is it? Let's do one example of the first case so we can show you know the easier one. We'll take a break, we'll do the second case, and then we'll do the complex eigenvalues. All right. So first one, solve the system of equations x prime equal to, I have the 3 by 3 matrix 1, negative 2, 2, negative 2, 1, negative 2, and 2, negative 2, 1. times my vector x. Okay. As I've already said, find the eigenvalues, just the easiest way to plug in. You'll end up with lambda equal to negative 1, negative 1, and 5. I do, let's say, the, just the one distinct one, since we've already done that. I, lambda equal to 5, call it lambda 1 equal to 5. And I plug that into the a minus lambda i. I do reduce row echelon form. I end up with 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, and then 0. This one will be the same. Since that's its own single distinct eigenvalue, I can just do this one the exact same way that I've done uh, the other ones. And that means K3, I'll set equal to S, of K1 minus S equals 0, K2 plus S equals 0. So K1 is S and K2 is negative S. And if I just let S equal 1, should be 1, negative 1, 1. Simple enough for that. whatever you want. I have had people on a test that, you know, you end up with something simple. They're just like, hey, I'm just going to let it be pi or something like that. Like, okay, you can, but it's not, it's not fun. I mean, it's kind of fun. But whatever it is, it doesn't equal anything. Just make sure that those ratios correspond. Right? For the second eigenvalue, the repeated eigenvalue that we have with negative 1, call that lambda 2. When we do reduce row echelon, again, when I plug that in, remember I'm plugging into a minus lambda i. Don't forget this part because that make sure we get the right reduced row echelon form. So take 1 minus negative 1, 1 minus negative 1 along the diagonal and keep the rest of those. Make sure you're doing that so that you get this corresponding form that we're going to find, which is 1, negative 1, and 1, and then zeros everywhere else.
this case, because it's a three by three and I have two full rows of zeros, this means I have what? Instead of just a single free variable like K3 here, I'm going to end up with two free variables, K2 and K3. Or, again, I said you can use whichever ones. I've had people use K1 and K2, or K1 and K3 even in this case. Doesn't matter, but again, I tend to go by, tend to work my way backwards. So if you see me doing that, that's just, it's just a habit. But I can let K3 be equal to S and let K2, since it's also free, be equal to, I believe they're going to use T. Oh, I didn't write it down. Not T. Don't use T. I'm going to use, what do they use? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use T. I don't like using T because that's actually part of our answer. So let's use R. I think that's the way I want to go. And you can flip those. It doesn't matter. Honestly, it doesn't matter what you use as long as you know, we just know that they're free variables and they're different. Right? In this case, that means K1, just don't use like E or I, because those mean something else. So stick, stay away from those letters. K1 whoops, minus R in this case, and then plus S is equal to zero. So K1 is equal to R minus S. And so when I put this into uh, an, an eigenvector in this case, I'm going to have those two free variables. And I want to associate each of them with a different vector. So when I write it as, say, I'm going to write this a little weird, K2 and K3 here are going to be R minus S, R and S. But I want to separate those out into the two different variables that we have, the two different free variables. So I'm going to have R, R and 0, and then plus negative S, 0 and S. I'm going to associate anything that has R in it if it has R in it, it goes in the first one, and if it doesn't, then we just put it as a zero. So that last K3, that third one, doesn't have R in it, so that becomes zero. This one doesn't have an S in it, that one becomes a zero. And I just want to associate the R's and the S's separately in this case. All right, and notice, I, I mean, I kind of separated it first, but if I just added these two vectors together, obviously, it gives me the first one. And then you can pick, again, for either of them. I can let R be equal to 1. I can let S be equal to 1. And I end up with a K2. That'll just be 1, 1, 0. And a K3. That'll just be negative 1, 0, 1. Right? And those are independent of each other because they were found with two different free variables. And I can use both of those. And again, I don't have to do all of that stuff that was written over here before. I found two distinct eigenvectors to go with my double root that we have here. And so I don't have to do anything crazy or anything special with this. I'm just going to have a solution that looks like x equals c1. 1, negative 1, 1, times e to the 5t, and then plus c2, 1, 1, 0, e to the negative t, plus c3, negative 1, 0, 1, e to the negative t. Don't know if that shows up. I'll have to figure this out for the next one. Probably missed a lot of the stuff I erased earlier. Whatever. All right. And that'll be our solution. Again, I say notice. I didn't have to multiply 
that second e to the negative t term by like an extra t or anything like that is because the eigenvectors themselves were linearly independent. And although this would be extraordinarily rare, uh, notice that even if, let's say, this k2 was 1, negative 1, 1, I wouldn't have to do it. I mean, that's not linearly independent of this, but since this is e to the 5d and this is e to the negative d, those two solutions are linearly independent. I wouldn't have to worry about that. So even if that one showed up the same as this one, that's okay. It, I don't know that I've ever seen that happen, but I just wanted to mention that in case it does come up. All right. So far, so good? All right, yeah. Is this like case, or is this number one? Okay. Yeah, this is the first first part of, of the case two for the repeated groups. The second one is what we'll do next. Uh, after, let's say, 10 minutes, come back at 12, what, that can't mean 12, that's an hour behind. Let's say 110, that one's, yeah, that's an hour behind. So go take a walk, take a break, come back at uh, 110 and then we'll do the second part of that, and then we'll do complex eigenvalues, and then we'll be done for today and for chapter eight. All right. Did you post it somewhere? I'm going to, yeah. I will. Uh... <clears throat> <laughs> oh, there you go. How was this class? That I didn't make it yesterday. It was just like definition. So basic stuff. Yeah. I think it's eight point one.
that was, again, the simpler case when we had repeated eigenvalues. Now, we're going to go with, all right, I got it still again. Um, the more complicated case. And we'll start, we'll do this one with just a two by two because it'll be <clears throat> a little bit easier to deal with. But let's say, I want to find the general solution of the homogeneous system of equations x prime equal to We'll have the matrix A is going to be 3, negative 18, and 2, negative 9. And then times our vector x. If I find the eigenvalues for this, get a repeated root. Of negative three. <coughs> and so I'm going to plug that one in to the a minus lambda i and then put it in our reduced row echelon form. I end up with one negative three and then zero, zero. Augment, augment that with the zero vector. And unfortunately, obviously, because of the way that that looks, and there's only one free variable associated with it, I'm only going to end up with one eigenvector for a repeated eigenvalue that we have. I right, let k2 be equal to s, k1 minus 3s is 0, so k1 is just 3s. I get a first eigenvector, that's just 3s and s, or just 3 and 1. If I let s be equal to 1 there. To find the second eigenvector, what we're going to do is I'm going to take that first one that we just solved for, and I'm going to put that in place of the zero vector that we're normally starting with. Now, very important when we do this, and be kind of, I say it's even, probably even more important because of the, the steps that I've, I've skipped and not put the augmented vector there earlier, but we're going to, <coughs> we're going to augment A1 with the A minus lambda I matrix that we have. All right, and then we're going to reduce row echelon form and solve from that. find the eigenvector as usual after that. What's important to note, obviously, obviously, is not to augment K1 with the reduced row echelon form here. Okay? Super important, because if I had this as 3, 1, then that would tell me that 0 is equal to 1, and that's impossible. I can't have that. So that should be a big clue right there that we can't do it in the first place. But that definitely means make sure we go back, put this vector that we found, and they'll call it, I think WebWork might, and I, and I think the book does too, call that one, or call the one that we're about to find P instead of K2, but the same idea. But anyways, make sure, again, make sure we take that vector that we just found, augment it with the original A minus lambda I part, and not with the reduced row echelon form that we found here. All right, so what that means, I'm going to end up with 
I'll have 3 minus negative 3 is going to give me 6. That'll still be negative 18. This will still be 2. And then I have negative 9 minus negative 3 is negative 6. And I'm going to take my 3, 1 original, not original, but first eigenvector that we found there. Augment that. Make sense. Definitely do that. Make sure it's not zero, zero, one, or anything like that. Yeah. So we're using those. So I'm using this one. Yeah. So this is always. I mean, this this one originally came from the same one. This this comes from doing three minus negative three, and negative nine minus negative three, and then negative eighteen, and two. But we're just augmenting that with zero, zero. And anytime I do that, I mean multiply zero and add it, it's always going to be zero there. That's the biggest difference with this. But we're still doing the same thing. I'm using this and doing a minus lambda i. So that augmented matrix right there is what you're using over here? So this, well, I'm not, that, that one's different because it's got the k1 instead of the zero, zero. Oh, on the right, okay. Yeah. And that's the biggest difference. And that's going to change how this gets reduced, too. So obviously, the second line is just a third of the first one. So this is just R2 minus a third R1. I'm just going to have 6, negative 18, 3, and then 0, 0, 0. Which is good. That's It's probably what we should end up with in most of these cases. I should be showing something that's going to allow me to find another eigenvector. If I wanted to Simplify that a little bit. Multiply by a third. So 2, negative 6, 1. And then I can say let k2 be equal to s, because that's still a free variable. But note in this case, I'm going to have 2k1 minus 6s is equal to 1, not equal to 0 now. Right? Because on the right hand side of this, I have a 1. So slight difference there. And I'm still going to solve for k1 here. So I'm going to add 6s to both sides, divide by 2, I'll get k1 is 1 half plus 3s. And here's where probably one of the bigger differences comes in that actually can make things a lot easier and make things make vectors a little bit simpler to deal with. My second vector, eigenvector, k2 or p, I guess again according to the book, or web work, in case it says that, I might mention it as p. I'm going to keep using k2, it just makes more sense. Hey, it's going to be equal to 1 half plus 3s and then just s. Now note here, since that 1 half is not being multiplied by s, like if I choose s to be equal to 2, it still doesn't change that. This is one situation where I'm going to end up with a fraction in that eigenvector, and there's just nothing I can do about it. I can't make it into an integer. The only thing I could possibly do would be to you know, make s like 1 half, and then do 1 half plus 3 halves. But the problem with that, obviously, is this s becomes 1 half. And so, you know. Um, but this would actually be a situation, if I'm trying to figure out what k2 is in the simplest form, I can, in this case, let s be equal to what? Zero. I can let s be equal to 0 now, because I still have that 1 half in the first term. And that means I don't end up with just the 0 vector. And if that's the case, if I can plug in s equal to 0, if we could have done that for anything before, we would have done that too. It would just make it easier. But any time before now, that would have made, that would have given us the 0 vector, and it wouldn't have helped. But since I can do it now, I can have 1 half and 0, that's perfectly fine. As long as, as, long as it's not identically 0 everywhere, no problem. All right? And then the last part of this would just be remembering to plug in to the right form. So once I've gotten that one, and like I said, as you'll note, it's not as complicated as a terrible process. It's just 
use the one that you find first and then do the same stuff. Right? Um, but making sure we get the right form of this is going to be the other thing. So, start off with the simple one. I found that first eigenvector. So I'm going to have C1 times K1, so just 3, 1, and then E to the negative 3T. Just like we would do if I had repeated uh, roots for the other one. I start off with just the same thing I would for distinct real roots. And then it gets more complicated. I'm going to have C2, and I'm going to use both of these eigenvectors that we found. All right? So in this case, I'm going to use the first one again. I'll have 3, 1. And I have to make that distinct from this first part. So I'm going to multiply by t, and then e to the negative 3t. And then the next part after that. I'm going to use my second eigenvector. So I'm going to have 1 half and 0. And that one doesn't need to be made distinct from the other one because it's already distinct with that eigenvector. So it's just times e to the negative 3t. Right. Weird way of going about it. And notice that the constant goes to this entire thing, to multiply to all of that in parentheses. Uh, if I had a, a third one, remember, I mean, this one seems obvious because it's the way we've kind of been doing it since the Q1. But remember, if I had a third one, like if I needed a plus C3, I'm going to have 3, 1, and then T squared over 2 factorial not just t squared, and then e to the negative 3t, and then plus, you know, 1 half 0 t e to the negative 3t, and then plus whatever this one is, just call that k3, times e to the negative 3t, right? That's what it looked like if I had a third one, if we had to go that far. Won't see that a lot, definitely, definitely won't see one of those on a test, because that's trying to plug in another one would be kind of crazy. Now it automatically mean we had a three by three where you had to plug those in. It's just that would get wild. But, uh, <clears throat> but that's the process. Just remember if you see a third one, slightly different than making them linearly independent before. It's not just t squared, t squared over two factorial, or t cubed over three factorial, or something like that. All right? But in any case, this is the solution for our problem. Right. Makes sense there. Be careful. I mean, an easy way to remember, like which one. Again, remember, I have the t going with the e to the lambda t, and then just the e to the lambda t. If you want to remember which of these vectors it goes with, obviously the t term or the t squared over two factorial term is going to go with what. Gonna go with which vector? Yeah, the one I found first already. Right. The one that I have to make linearly independent of that one. So, same same general idea as what we would have to be doing before. Trying to make every every solution linearly independent of the other ones. Right. Any questions on those so far? Ready. Pretty similar ideas along the way as what we've seen with just single equations. Right, and that means obvious, obviously we're going to be looking at our third case, which is going to be complex eigenvalues. I explained it with this. I guess I had a third example, but 
I didn't write everything out. I'm good. Everyone cool with the repeating average? All right. <coughs> so complex eigenvalues. Let's just write. Let's just write this out using a theorem. This theorem will tell us essentially the form that our our solutions for having complex eigenvalues with complex eigenvectors are going to take on. So if <coughs> lambda one equal to alpha plus beta i, is a complex eigenvalue of a of the matrix A in the homogeneous system x prime equal to ax. Then two linearly independent solutions of the system are given by uh, x1. And this is where it's, I mean, it's not going to, it's going to look just vaguely familiar because we're going to use sines and cosines and the exponential function again, but it gets much, much wilder with these systems of equations. So <coughs> x1 is going to be what we'll call vector b1 times cosine of beta t. And then minus a vector b2 times sine of beta t. And then the other linearly independent solution is x2 which is going to be b1 times sine of beta t and then plus B2 times cosine of beta t. Oh, I forgot part of this. Because it's the easiest part to leave out while trying to remember the order that these go in. Um, both of those are multiplied by e to the alpha t on the outside. But in this case, B1 is uh, the real part of an eigenvector K1. A real part of K1, and then B2 would be the imaginary part of that same vector. And we won't use the imaginary numbers, but we'll use the associated vectors that go along with the imaginary part. All right. And K1 is the eigenvector of lambda equal to alpha plus beta i. Notice these are both going to, uh, both of those solutions essentially account for the conjugate as well. We're only going to use alpha plus beta i here, but it gives us the entire solution. Um, we don't have to go back and do lambda equal to, or the other one, a, uh, alpha minus beta i. We're accounting for it with that theorem and the solutions that it gives. All right. That's the form that we're looking for. And obviously, these are the two solutions. I'm going to combine these in a linear combination when I find the entire, the general solution. So it'll be x equals c1 times that plus c2 times that. 
All right. It's complicated. It's a, a, again, it's a system of equations. It's, it's just going to get better. The more equations we add, the crazier stuff is going to get. That's just how it's going to go. All right. Um, and this will look a little bit different. I'm going to say we're just going to go through and solve it the same way. In the book and a lot of, of other things I've seen, it seems like when they find these eigenvalues and the associated eigenvectors, they do a lot of intuitive type of, of stuff trying to get to it from when you have the reduced row echelon form and all that. I don't do that. I just, I'm going to tell you, and the way that I will do it, like when I write out a key or something like that, is the same way that we've already been doing stuff. So if you're looking through the book and it says, oh, here's the reduced row echelon form, so obviously this is the, the corresponding eigenvector. I don't think it's that obvious, so we're going to go through the process of solving it. All right, so let's say I want to solve x prime equal to let's see in matrix two eight negative one negative two. Did the alpha, the determinant of uh, sorry of a minus lambda i, I end up with lambda squared plus four, so lambda is going to be equal to plus or minus two i in this case. That gives me an alpha that's zero, which means I don't have to necessarily worry about these extra terms here, and a beta that's going to be equal to two. Right. <coughs> so when we do this, I'm going to again I'm going to go ahead for this one. Just to explain where some of this comes from, um, I'm actually going to do this first one out with, with some of the, the row operations to just to show where they come from and why we're getting to a point where we're getting to. Um, but if I did, remember I'm going to use just the plus one, lambda or alpha plus beta i over there. So we'll use that one, don't worry about anything else. Uh, but having said that, if I use the positive one, remember it's a minus that. So 2 minus 2i two would be negative 2 minus 2i. Two 8 negative 1. What I'm going to do to make sure I can actually do something about this, instead of um, you know, trying to figure out what I can multiply this by to make it look like this. First thing I'm going to do is just try to make this first one into a constant. So I can do, I, then if I just multiply by 2 or multiply by negative 5, whatever, I can do that. So to turn 2 minus 2i into a constant by just doing a row operation, I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. Now remember, I have to do that to both terms, or actually all three terms on the top, but that third one's zero. But if I do 2 plus 2i times 2 minus 2i, I'm going to get 4 minus 4i squared. squared is negative 1, so that's just 4 plus 4. So I have an 8 on the top, and then 8 times 2 plus 2i. I also have a negative 1 on the bottom, and a negative 1 times 2 plus 2i. helpful because then obviously my row operation is just r2 plus 1 eighth r1. Okay. 
have eight, and then eight times two plus two i on the top, and a zero, and then zeros on the bottom as before. And we go ahead and divide by eight, just to make this easier. This, by the way, again, I, I'm not going to ask you to do all that. I'm just showing you when I when I give this part, this matrix part to you on the test, that's where it comes from. That's how we're, we get to it. <coughs> all right. But sometimes it's confusing. As what happened to all the imaginary numbers on the second one? Like, how did they cancel? Well, kind of manipulated it a little before that. All right. Again, this would be the part in the book where they'd say, okay, so here's your, here's your eigenvector because, because it's this and that. I'm not doing that. I would say again, the same stuff we've already been doing, just do it again. Just do the exact same thing. I have two terms there. One of them is a free variable. I'm just going to let k2 be equal to s. And then that means k1 plus 2 plus 2i times s, and just make sure you're multiplying all of that in parentheses there, is equal to zero. And make sure, gotta be careful it, with the parentheses and stuff like that. That's the place I've seen people get a little confused with this. But I'll just have k1 is negative 2 plus 2i times s. And if it helps, multiply all that stuff through multiply the s in, multiply the negative in, just so that you don't lose a sign somewhere or anything like that. So when I have my k1 here, it's going to look like negative 2s minus 2i s, and then just s. And I could let s be equal to Not zero, unfortunately, in this case, but. I think I know what I have on here, but I'm going to guess at it anyways. Let s be equal to, I want to say negative one in this one. And that way, the imaginary part up there that we're dealing with is all positive. So I end up with 2 plus 2i and negative one. Yeah, you got to be equal to one, same idea. So the only other thing I have to worry about with this, remember this is the, the eigenvector k1. I need that b1 and b2, the associated real part and imaginary part. So I'm just going to split this up into the real part. So 2 and negative 1. And then plus the imaginary part, which will be 2, 0 times i. So that makes this one B1 and that one B2. And then it's just plugging in, make sure to remember um, which one goes where and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to give me X equal to C1. And then I'm going to have, <coughs> remember it was B1 sine or cosine. Cosine first. So B1 cosine of beta, in this case beta is 2, so cosine of 2t, and then minus B2, 2, 0, times sine of 2t, all times e to the alpha t, which we kind of left out, alpha is just row in this one, plus C2, and then I'll have B1 again, 2, negative 1, sine of 2t, and then this one's plus 2, 0, cosine of 2t. So 
times e to the 0. Yeah, even though you know we're dealing with imaginary stuff up there, it, I really the form is probably the hardest part of getting the complex numbers because this again once we have the reduced form, which you can get easily, and I'll give to you, it's just finding it the same way. There's no, there's no difference between that. The only thing would be to make sure um, if actually since I'm giving that to you, it shouldn't even be a problem, but. Um, trying to think if there's a situation where you'd even have to do it. Because we shouldn't be finding repeated roots, so you, shouldn't, you should be able to get both of these. I was going to say, if this wasn't just zero here, like if we had a lambda that was one plus or minus two i, but you're still doing the same thing. You just have to be a little careful. Do two minus one plus two i here, and then negative two minus 1 plus 2i there, 8 and negative 1. But again, you just combine those and do exactly what we did. I don't think there's a situation where you really have to go through that, but it's the same idea. You just have to be, just have to be a little careful with the, the distribution of the negative sign. 